So welcome to the history of Western Swing at the Fort Worth Public Library. Super happy to be here. Um, if you're joining us again, if you were here last week, awesome. We talked about some early Western Swing if you weren't here. And good news is the library is archiving everything. And I also have a little um, website that I've set up for all of the materials like PowerPoints and any songs that we heard through the day. So you can follow that. Okay, let's get going. We have a lot to cover today. So when I was thinking about designing this course, um, again, we went over the overview last week. This week, I wanted to focus a little bit on some of the sidemen. And there are so many people. There's so many people in Western Swing, so many bands. It's impossible to squeeze it into an hour. But I want to focus on some of the people that I personally knew or know. Many of them are gone. Some of them are still around. But these were people that were part of, you know, creating this music that I got to know and travel with and get to play with. So you'll hear some personal recollections. Not anything you can find on a Wikipedia page for sure. Some, uh, some of them were kind of naughty and pranksters, and it's pretty funny to hear these stories. So I hope that you all enjoy. Um, again, I did set up a little website if you want to write that down at all. The History of Western Swing Educator Pages. Com. That'll help you stay on top of things. Okay, here we go, folks. All right, so again, here's a list of some of the folks that I'm going to go over today. Uh, many of them were either from here or they got here as fast as they could, or they definitely played a lot around in these areas and moved here uh, maybe as adults. And I have personally know or have known many of those folks, and it's been a joy to learn from them as a Western Swing musician. Okay, starting with Marvin Smokey Montgomery. So we learned about the Light Crest Doughboys a bit last week, but I really didn't get to focus a lot on Marvin because we were talking about the period really before he was there. So he was born Marvin Dooley Wetter on March 17th in Iowa. He was singing in church. He started playing the banjo, and you know this was a, a rough time. He was growing up actually helping his family make ends meet, so he was being put to work. Um, he ended up in a tent show and came to Dallas. All right. <laughs> I think that's funny that he chose his name because of Robert, Robert Montgomery. I just wanted to include that. He eventually joined the Light Crest Doughboys in 35, so Bob and Milton had kind of moved on, uh, they had started their own projects, and Marvin was a part of the Light Crest Doughboys by that point. Um, interestingly, he manufactured six-inch shells for the U.S. Navy during the war. So he was known as Smokey because he could play so fast that his hands looked like smoke. That's how he got that nickname, and I'm sure that he loved that. He was definitely part of a signature sound of bringing this ragtime banjo style and blending it with the jazz and the blues and helping bring it to Western swing. Okay, so you can see here just some of the other later projects in his life. Uh, when I was researching, I had no idea that he had been part of Summit Burnett Studios. That wasn't uh, a part of my life. By the time I was alive, I really wasn't hanging out at Summit Burnett like a lot of my older Western swing friends were, but I had learned that Smokey was part of building that studio. He was part of the very last Bob Wills recording in, did we say 76? For the last time is 76, Michael Price. In 75, okay. This man is a human archive, he helps me. And so is William Williams. <laughs> um, also, you know, the Lycrest Doughboys had played the Main Street Arts Fest at one point. Um, just wonderful. They've been right here in the heart of Fort Worth and have had a tenure as one of the longest lasting and standing Western swing bands in history. So they're like the Rolling Stones of Western swing, y'all. <laughs> they were around a long time. Uh, you can see that in 89, they were inducted into the Western Swing Hall of Fame. In any of their later music, you'll find that they really had a huge shift toward gospel. I have a couple of the gospel LPs, and, and they are wonderful, but they definitely shifted their sound. So I wanted to give you all a chance to check out a little bit of Smokey on camera. Let me see. Go back. All my life, I've, I've been interested in music and been a musician. I really loved the banjo. Banjo was my first love. 
For as long as Marvin Smokey Montgomery has been able to make a C chord, banjo music has been a part of his life. In fact, for more than 60 years, he's been strumming along with the world-famous Light Crust Doughboys. In that time, Smokey's made lots of music and a few innovations, too. They gave me credit for establishing the Dixieland-style banjo into the country western music. When they put me in the Country Hall of Fame in 1989 down in Austin, that's what they put on the plaque, whether I started that style banjo. <laughs> Marvin wasn't always known as Smokey, but he carries the name as an honor, a description of his fast-fingered style. When I'd play the banjo here, my wrist would blur, and our MC would say, Junior, that was my nickname, Junior will now smoke up the banjo. And one night he says, Smokey, when I smoke up the banjo. And when we got off the air, I says, uh, Mel, I'll just call me Smokey from now on. Now there's more than just picking and grinning in Smokey's repertoire. He's also an accomplished writer and producer. In fact, back in 1963, he produced the number one hit, Hey Paula. The Light Crust Doughboys are on there. It's music in Smokey's blood, but it's the Doughboys in his heart. Our big thing now is getting the Grammy uh, nomination. That was uh, <laughs> the biggest honor we could possibly get with the Doughboys. And if we ha accidentally win the thing, uh, what, what else can we get? You know, how, how good can you feel? I'll jump up and down and turn around and do flip-flops. And I can't even skip anymore. <laughs> Seven decades of practice would definitely make any banjo player better. It's made Marvin Smokey Montgomery a legend. But you won't hear that from Smokey. He lets the music do the talking. And the rest, he says, is just icing on the cake. Up until just the last few years, I haven't realized that maybe I had a lot, uh, quite a bit of influence on this style of music. To me, it's been an honor to be able to play with the Doughboys all these years. Uh, it's been my whole life, practically, as being a, a Doughboy. It's, it's, it's been my whole life, and it's kept me happy. I'm, about, I'm as happier now, I guess, than I ever been, have been in my own life. I'm still going to keep doing it as long as I can, because if I sit down in a rocket chair, goodbye world, you know? So that was Smokey Montgomery. We're going to move along to Buddy Brady. He was a personal friend of mine. So Buddy was born in Tyler, Texas. He had moved to this area around 1953 and he was fiddling for this shindig show on WFAA until 1956. He was a part of the Light Crust Doughboys as well. He had gone around campaigning with old Pappy O'Daniel and then also made several television and radio appearances. I wanted to read something about Buddy because one of the very, very special things that he did, he was a part of the house band for the Mesquite Championship Rodeo for years. Uh, you can see from 1989 until he died in 2013. So the beginning of country and Western music was but a mere collaboration of regional instruments and soldiers during World War II. It was during this time period that a young Buddy Brady was sharpening his skills on the fiddle in Tyler. Buddy Brady and the Men of the West is a country and Western band that has played for the past 15 seasons of the Mesquite Championship Rodeo. Before Brady's affiliation with the Mesquite Rodeo, he did quite a bit of entertaining of other media. In 53, Brady moved from Dallas to Tyler. He fiddled for the Shindig Show, on Radio WFAA until 56. From there, he went road campaigning all over with Poppy Leo Daniel. In the meantime, Dewey Groom was tending to the Longhorn Ballroom in Fort Worth. Brady picked up the fiddle again. There was a 30-minute segment that aired on Channel 11 in Fort Worth. It featured the Longhorn Ballroom's Western music and Brady's fiddle playing during the segment. In 85, Groom sold the ballroom, so once more, Brady picked up and hit the road. He joined Tex Ritter and toured across the rodeo nation. Four years later, the Fiddler settled into a gig that has now lasted 15 years. It all began when Brady got together with a man named Morris Rosam. They both played the fiddle and entertained the audience before and during the rodeo on weekend nights. A Fort Worth resident, Brady spends his weekdays at his fiddle repair shop. So I had the opportunity, I played with Buddy as a part of the Mesquite Championship Band for several years, and he was just a character. He kind of had this funny way of talking, shoveling his voice, and he never really got, ever got my last name right. 
I, I was going by my legal name, Jenny McLaughlin, and he'd go like, oh, we got Jenny McLemore, or we got Jenny McElfin, or we got Jenny McNamara. You know, it was always something. But he was a doll, and we'd kind of play right between events, a song or half a song, and then we'd for the cue, and oh, he'd just turn over and just oh, cut us right off. It was such an experience. I interviewed him one time for a school project when I was a teenager, and that was a joy. I also had the opportunity to record a song with him on my very first album. So it's called Bud and Jen, which stood for Buddy and Jenny, and it was meant to be kind of a real loose hokum style. We recorded it uh, myself, Buddy, Devin Dawson on the guitar, Ronnie Dale Schultz on the bass, all around a microphone in a live room. So it's got that feel for sure, and I hope y'all will enjoy it. kiddo. So there's a photo if you go uh, right in the center that's the governor of Mississippi just to the right that's a very young buddy Brady. So he was a sweet 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 man. I miss him. Okay moving right along Mr. Joe Frank Ferguson. So Joe Frank was born here in Fort Worth Texas. He was a bassist for the Light Crest Doughboys and also Bob Wills. Um, he performed in the original Texas Playboys final concert in 1986 at Will Rogers, which is incredible. I do have an excerpt for us to watch today, uh, which we'll get to in a little bit, but you can watch, I think it's divided up into nine parts on YouTube, and you can see the whole thing. It's really beautiful. Um, it happened right after Al Strickland died. One month after he died, they, they had this tribute, well, a, a tribute concert, essentially. And then he died on Valentine's Day in Fort Worth. So I have a funny story about Joe Frank because I had seen him play at the Red Seagull Cowboy Gathering with the Texas Playboys Band, been there dancing that night. I'm a teenager, you know, 15, 16. And I was also studying classical piano and accordion at the same time that I was out doing Western swing dances. 
And my teacher loved that. She was a classical musician, but she said, hey, you know what, I think that it would be great if in addition to your classical repertoire, you did some of the Western swing music you're working on at your recital. So here I go, I play my classical Rachmaninoff and whatnot, and then I get my accordion out, and I play a Red Stegall song. So I'm doing this Western swing song and my cowgirl hat and the whole nine yards. And at the very end of the program, this woman comes up to me and she says, I would love for you to meet my great grandfather. She says, his name is Joe Freak Ferguson, and he's a Western swing musician. And I said, oh my goodness, I just saw him play. And he had to be 89, 90 years old at this point. Anyhow, it was a treat. Not even a month or two after I'd seen him play, he was right there at my recital and was so overjoyed that a child was playing Western swing music. So we did get to meet, and he was a, also a precious soul. He was known for singing the song Marie with the Texas Playboys. And that's included in that concert that, if you'd like to look it up. Okay, moving right along to Mr. Al Strickland. There's Al at his piano. Born Alton Meek Strickland in Antioch, Texas. He began very, very early, and I love this quote. I never heard anything like country music. Jazz was all I ever tried to play. <laughs> he performed to pay his way through college, and those were a couple of the bands that he was a part of. I wanted to read this little bit about when he first met Bob Wills. In 1930, Al Strickland was the assistant program director at radio station KFJZ in Fort Worth. A frightened secretary cried out one morning, Mr. Strickland, will you please come in here a moment? He rushed into the reception room and saw three guys standing there. They were all hungry looking and they needed a shave. One of them had something in a flour sack. The other one had a guitar strapped across his back, hanging over his back like he was carrying a rifle or something. Strickland was almost as startled as the secretary. It was Mr. Bob Wills, he said, with a fiddle in a flower sack. Wills asked Strickland for an audition. Wills and his band then performed on KFJZ. They called two days later from the post office and said there was so much mail for the station, one man couldn't carry it. Better bring a pickup or something. Strickland had given Wills a break, and when the management of the Aladdin Lamp Company learned the success of the Wills fiddle band on KFJZ, the firm sponsored the band under the name Aladdin Laddies over WBAP, a much more powerful station. Ironically, Strickland, who at the time did not take Wills seriously, actually thought the music was intended as comedy. He left Fort Worth to become principal and sixth and seventh grade teacher in Island Grove, Texas. By 1934, he was back in Fort Worth playing piano with a dance band called the High Flyers. So at this point, it's pretty incredible to think about the impact that he had on Western swing music. I'll continue on that it, he had joined Bob Will's band after some time. He'd never played in a Western band. And other than the frontier fiddle music Wills often performed, Strickland said, there was no difference in playing with Bob and jazz bands I'd played with. Since I was the first piano player Bob ever worked with, I set the style for piano players in Western swing bands. Bob didn't want the piano to play melody. When he told the piano to tear it up, you went into orbit. I played hokum, we called it. I can't play the same way twice. I write as I go. To save my life, I can't play the same way twice. You compose and create as you play. When Bob G Wills gave me a chorus, I played jazz. <laughs> so he thought of himself through and through as a jazz musician. So he was a huge teacher and influence on Floyd Domino. And if you've ever heard of the band Asleep at the Wheel, Floyd was the original piano player in the wheel. And Strickland taught him, he'll say everything he knew early on. They were very close and he was his teacher. Um, of course, we noted earlier he died October 15th, 1986, which was one month before the original Texas Playboys concert. Moving right along while we're talking about it, you can see the lineup here that was at that concert held at Will Rogers Coliseum. And this was their set list, incredible set list, all the greats. Marie, Joe Frank Ferguson vocal. Um, all vocals from Leon, Ra Leon Rausch, unless otherwise noted. So let's watch a little bit of that concert, shall we? <laughs> of thousands of times have heard the applause of the audience, but I want this to be the applause they remember. Nobody sit on your hands now. I don't care if you don't even sit. Make welcome for the last time. 
Bob Will's original Texas Playboy. <laughs> Well, listen, everybody, from near and far, if you want to know who we are, we're the Texas Playboys from the Lone Star State. Now, if you like the way we play, listen while we're trying to say, we're the Texas Playboys from the Lone Star State. And all day long, Working on the railroad, sleeping on the ground, eating saltine crackers, ten cents a pound. Big balls in Cowtown, we all go down. Big balls in Cowtown, we we'll dance around. Shake all them sack blues, the big balls in town. Big balls in Cowtown, we'll all go down. Big balls in Cowtown, we'll dance around. Working on the railroad, sleeping on the ground, eating saltine crackers, ten cents a pound. Big balls in Cowtown, we'll all go down. Big balls in Cowtown, we'll dance around. Saltine crackers, ten cents a pound. Big balls in Cowtown, we'll all go down. Big balls in Cowtown, big balls in town. Thank you. Thank you very much, friends. It's really great to be here. Sad to be here under certain conditions. And we thank you all for coming. And, of course, we're going to be kind of choked up all through this because we loved Al Strickland. And we loved all each other for 51 years. And there's a lot going through our hearts. But on behalf of all the Texas Playboys, if you haven't met them before, don't know who they are, I want to go quickly around the circle and introduce them. And, and Moving right along to Miss Louise Rowe. Have you all seen Louise? You've seen Louise, I'm sure. So you can see beautiful Louise there on the front row. She is known as the only Texas playgirl. 
<laughs> All right, she's still around. She is still around. I just saw her a few months ago. Uh, she was out at the birthplace of Western Swing Festival at National Hall, and she came up and played. She is sticking with it. She's got to be 89 or 90 years old. A D magazine? Okay, great. That'll be something worth checking out. She's a very interesting woman. So again, the only woman to ever get a paycheck from the Texas Playboys, kind of the original group. I have had a paycheck from the Texas Playboys. <laughs> Not that installment of them, but a version of them, yes. Met Wills in 52 with the Seven Rows, Row brothers. So at first he loved, she sang. So he's like, oh, come on. You know, they love to have girl singers. That's what they call it. We need a girl singer. I think they just like to have a female presence on stage. Well, then he realized she could play. She was a musician. And so she toured, she sang harmony, and she played bass. So we're going to hear a little bit. This is a 1953 radio broadcast from Louise, and she's singing a song called Fool, Fool, Fool. All right. Charm us, Miss Louise. Louise, that's your little heart. What is you going to sing? I'm going to sing Fool, Fool, Fool. Wait a minute now. Quit calling me a fool. I want to know what you're going to sing. I'm you a fool. Oh. I'm a fool. I mean, I'm singing. <laughs> then you hit the nail on the head. You mean that's the title of the that's song? That's the title of the song. Okay, you know, I'm going to quit fussing her one of these days. I call her a little old silly name because she's believing it. One, two, three. Well, all right, Billy. That's another bit of fun. Texan Playboy is a Texan kitchen in Ulyss. Does anyone in the room know if she's still doing that, Michael or William? I couldn't find anything about it, but she used to play out there Saturday nights. Anyway, that was one of the most recent things that she was doing. Even up to a few years ago, this woman was playing every Saturday night in Ulyss and, and still, still going. She still dresses just pristine. She always looks so beautiful, and she's really sweet. 
And anyhow, if you get the chance to catch her, I'm sure she'll be at the uh, birthplace of Western Swing Festival this November at, Na at National Hall. It's right here, Roberts Cutoff Road. So you want to go and check her out. <laughs> All right. Yep, 90 years old and still going. So I want to get into Mr. Leon Rausch. Um, he just recently died. Leon died in 2019 and miss him dearly. Uh, he was born in Billings, Missouri. He's known as the voice of the Texas Playboys. Of course, Tommy Duncan was as well, but uh, Leon joined the Playboys in the 50s. So he started out singing in church choir. He was playing music as a very, very young kid, as many of us do. He joined the Navy for a time, but he really missed playing music. So he started hearing Bob Wills on the radio. And my goodness, he was playing music very young. He moved to Tulsa. Um, you can see some of the projects that he was a part of there. All right. He met Bob Wills at Lindsay Land in Oklahoma City. So I love this. Leon made $120 a week at the Pittsburgh Glass Company, but Bob's offer was $90 a week. And I met, I knew Leon's wife, Vonda. What a trooper this woman was. A very reserved, beautiful, and quiet woman. I love that she said, I'll just go along with whatever you want to do. So he took a pay cut to follow his dreams, and she was just right by his side. All right, Leon. And it was a pretty wild pair. I mean, they were like a semicolon. You know, she was really tiny, and he was this larger-than-life man and a larger-than-life personality. And Vonda, uh, again, was just very reserved and very elegant. So he joined from 58 to 61. And for a time, he was not a member of the band. It was Tommy had returned and Leon left for a bit. They started a family. He just needed to get off the road for a bit. Um, you can see here some of his later projects, part of Johnny Lee Wills. Uh, he had been the house band at Panther Hall in Fort Worth, and I, I found some photos that we can take a look at and see some of his Fort Worth gigs. Um, he did join the For the Last Time recording, so again, I'd love to emphasize if, if you were to have a, a, a later Bob Wills record, that's the very last one that he was a part of, and it is an incredible album to own. Oh, and Leon Roush Day in Fort Worth. Isn't that lovely? October 2nd. I kind of want to throw a big party or something. <laughs> um, I did get a chance. I'll play just a little bit of this, but I recorded with Leon as a teenager. So, of course, we've heard some of his earlier stuff with the Bob Wills Texas Playboys, but you'll get to hear him a little bit with me right now. <laughs> I'm a child. Okay, let's skip ahead. I'm in heaven And my heart beats so That I can hardly speak He was about 75 years old And I seem to find The happiness I see When we're out together Dancing cheek to cheek Heaven Heaven. I'm in heaven. Ooh, in heaven And those cares that hung around me through the, week, oh, through the week They seem to vanish like a gambler's lucky streak You're gonna take my cares away When we're out together, dancing cheek to cheek All right, Mr. Rash. <laughs> Okay. All right. So here were some of these photos. So this is at Panther Hall, Leon Roush and the Texas Panthers. We'll get a little bit into Tom Morell, Leon Chambers, Bob Boat right there on the very end. Another one from Panther Hall. So that was over at East Lancaster in Collard. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To put in perspective, good question. So we know where we are. <laughs> and there we go, another one from Panther Hall. So 
larger than life fella. We used to have these jokes where he'd say, he'd come up and go, you get uglier and uglier every time I see you. And I'd tell him, you get more ornery every time I see you. So we, we wanted to make these t-shirts that said, I'm with ornery and I'm with ugly. Anyway, <laughs> never happened, but <laughs> uh, they, he, he had a lot of stories about some rough times. I, well, I remember one time he, was, he told me a story. He was playing a dance, and nobody, he kept promoting their record all the, the whole time. Hey, I got this new record, these new records, these new records, and nobody was really buying the records, and Leon got pretty upset, and he grabbed the box of records and started chucking them out into the audience, <laughs> like frisbees, people darting records. You know, he was, uh, he calmed down in his older age, but he was known to have a little bit of a temper. <laughs> Moving right along to Mr. Alsop. Okay, so there was one. This is on the front porch of my house in Turkey, Texas. We were just picking and grinning, singing songs together. So Mr. Alsop, born in Oklahoma, and he was known for touring with Buddy Holly and the Crickets. So you may have heard the story of the famous coin toss. If you haven't, um, this was the Big Bopper, Richie Valens, Buddy Holly, Waylon Jennings and Tommy Alsop all on tour. And there were only three seats on the plane and they flipped a coin to find out who would have to take the bus. And Tommy Alsop and Waylon Jennings took the bus and we know what happened to the other three. So it, it was always hard for Tommy. Even in his later years, if he talked about it, he would tear up. It, it really was a hard thing for him to know that that, that that single coin toss had determined his fate and the others. Um, here's a just, <laughs> just some of the people that he produced and played with. The, the list is endless. Um, he moved to Fort Worth. He'd opened Tommy's Heads Up Saloon. He produced albums for Asleep at the Wheel, and he also produced the For the Last Time album uh, from Bob Wills and the Texas Playboys. So he kind of became the director after Bob passed away for the Texas Playboys. This was an album that he did under Common Ground Records. Uh, you can see some of the folks that were guests and sang the music of Western Swing on this album. It was an incredible project. <laughs> I have a funny story about being in Kroll, Texas and playing a street dance. And Tommy, I was on the gig, my little brother was on the gig. And I had been given this bottle of whiskey, this Tyrconnell Irish whiskey. And Tommy loved Irish whiskey, but he had never heard of this, this whiskey. And I said, well, it's only really imported into New Orleans. Nobody really gets it here. A friend of mine from Idaho orders it by the case and gave me a bottle. And so we went out to the car. I had maybe this much left. And the three of us, you know, my little brother and myself and Tommy, we all just kind of passed it around and took a few sips. And Tommy just kept drinking going, oh, this is so good. This is so good. So I finally had, we had maybe this much left, and I said, oh, it's yours. And he just knocked it right <laughs> back. Gulp, gulp, gulp. He loved it. But, uh, sorry. Oh, I know. Tighten up. Archie Bell. So he brought in some really interesting people. I mean, you can see uh, people you wouldn't expect. I mean, many of them are from country music, but Archie Bell's not. It, Wilford Brimley saying, St. Louis Blues? He's a crooner. He's a crooner. He's a crooner. Right, right. Um, and then Chance from the Music Mafia, that's a, he did That's What I Like About the South. That's actually a pretty interesting cut. Anyhow, if you, get, if you can find that album, check it out. It's pretty great. <laughs> Glenn Campbell sings I Want to Be Wanted. Um, anyway, beautiful album. Another funny story, I don't know if y'all know the artist Amanda Shires. Uh, she's a great artist of her own right, and she also tours with Jason Isbell. They're, they're married. But she used to run around with all of us, too, playing Western swing music, and she would tell everyone Tommy Ossip was her dad to get in somewhere, which was great. <laughs> she was always teaching me tricks, too, but one time Billy Joe Shaver proposed to her, and she said, we're going to have to ask my dad. And he said, who's your dad? And, and she said, Tommy Ossip. Of course, Billy Joe knows Tommy. So he calls up Tommy one day and he says, Tommy, I'd like to ask for your daughter's hand in marriage. And Tommy went, Amanda. <laughs> he just knew. Amanda was always playing tricks on people. 
Yes, <laughs> I just love that. She, she's, I swear, she, she's like, tell everyone that Tommy's our dad. We'll, we'll get in. <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> oh, shenanigans. Okay. Whew. Okay. Bob Boatwright. So you may have noticed he was one of the fiddle players in the original Texas Playboys concert clip that we watched earlier. Bob was from Denison, Texas. Hey, aren't you from Denison? We've got another Denison fella. Hey, Big Mike. All right, he died in 2008. So he's another one very dearly departed and missed. He began playing fiddle very young and he had the most beautiful classical style of playing. He was a very refined musician. He did a lot of fiddle arrangements, which we'll hear in a minute, but he, very much like we heard Spade Cooley, had a really refined, classically influenced style. Same with Bob. He brought a lot of class and elegance to the fiddle playing on the stage. He was also an academic. He majored in math and physics. He taught at Cameron University, and he also taught here at Weatherford Junior College. He used to help me with my calculus and physics homework all the time. And he gave me a lot of his old calculus and physics books, which is great. And books he had when he was in college. And you can see his beautiful penmanship where he wrote his name on the inside. This book belongs to Bob Boatwright. Um, he'd started a family in the 60s and was around in this area. So he met his wife in 1960 when he was playing a barn dance. I wanted to read this little excerpt from an article. My mother went to dance there and I came to get her, Linda Boatwright recalled. He got down off the bandstand and asked me to dance with him. Everyone almost passed out because he was so shy. <laughs> he was very shy. Hired to play in the original Texas Playboys with Leon and Tommy and the guys, so the band that we saw the clip of. He played with Roush for 35 years. And I did want to just make an, a note. Again, we talked about his incredible ear and his harmonies, his arranging. Um, he was all very interested in preserving a lot of old folk music, too. So many of the albums he put out were old folk melodies that maybe you heard as kids, and, and he would revive them and do these beautiful fiddle arrangements. He was quite a prankster. So <laughs> I loved, you saw uh, earlier in the clip, Gene Gassaway and Bob playing together. He played pranks on Gene all the time. It was so unfair. My favorite one was that he stuck a piece of Lindbergh cheese up under, <laughs> under Gene's chin rest. And that's a really pungent cheese. So Gene couldn't figure out what was wrong. And, and all the fiddle players, Curly Lewis and everybody, they were all in on it. And he, they'd go, man, Gene, that fiddle stinks. <laughs> What's wrong with your fiddle? You know, and poor Gene is just having to play right there, has no idea what went wrong. So he was, he was a prankster. He also was known one time to put talcum powder into the female singer's tambourine. And she went out to play it and just like was a dust of powder. Yeah, he was rough. Um, one time someone played a prank on him because he hated, hated the harmonica with a fiery passion. He couldn't stand it. And somebody photoshopped a photo of him with a harmonica <laughs> around his neck. And he was, he didn't like it. He told me in secret, he's like, I didn't, that wasn't very, that, I didn't like that at all. I'm like, well, Bob, you can dish it out, but you can't take it. <laughs> so just to get a little sample of what he sounded like. <laughs>
behind myself here. Okay. All right, and this is just so that you can check it out. These are some of his recordings, and they are up on YouTube. You can find them. You can also find them online. I'm, I think that some are still for sale, but if not, you can pull them up digitally. All right. Wolf Morell, old Tommy. So he was born Halloween, 1938, in Little Elm, Texas. And does this date sound familiar to anyone? <laughs> this was the famous War of the Worlds radio broadcast from Orson Welles. So I, I don't know if anyone knows this story, but this caused a massive panic because this was, you know, read on the radio like a play, but people thought that this was happening in real time and that there was a Martian invasion. And so th there's a little speculation about how much real panic it caused. But the next day, Orson Welles is like, I didn't mean to scare anyone. There are no aliens. We're not under attack. But it caused this joke to go around among the Western swing crowds that Morell was actually just an alien that was sent to us because he was pretty wild. So he recorded 15 album or 15 volumes of his How the West Was Swung series. I love that every album he put out was just volume two, volume three, volume four. He just didn't, it didn't stop until he died. I, I loved it. It's like 15 volumes. Um, he was inducted into the Texas Steel Guitar Hall of Fame in 88. And most of what I know about Tommy is just from my my personal stories with him. Um, he traveled a lot with me. Later on in life, he couldn't really, you know, drive out to the Rio Doso Festival anymore. And so he would travel with me and my family and tell us the wildest stories. We'd drive by some hotel off 20, he'd be like, got kicked out of there once, you know, it's like, to tell some wild story. Um, probably the one that means the most to me was uh, when he was in the hospital, the very end of his life, I went to visit him. My brother and I had just written a song about him that we wanted to record. And when we went in there, we knew he wasn't going to make it. We could tell we'd never get to spend time with him again. And we kind of hugged him like, get well soon, and walked out of the room and burst into tears when we got to the car. And he was, he was gone a few days later. Um, but at that visit, we had gotten back from Rio Doso, and one of the things he loved was the cherry cider. So we'd always stop along the way, get some cherry cider and a little fruit stand, and bring it, you know, he, he'd bring it, have it at home. Well, we decided to bring him some in the hospital. So we bring him this, this gallon of cherry cider, you know. Hey, Tom, we got you some cider. Everything's great. And he's just 90 pounds and hooked up to a hospital bed. He wasn't doing well. So we leave. And I never thought about the cider again. And it wasn't until two years later, I was at a Western Swing Festival in, this, in a jam session. This man comes up to me and he says, excuse me, are you Jenny Mack? I said, yes. And he goes, did you bring Tom Morell some cherry cider in the hospital? <laughs> and I run out of this jam session, like, how do you know that? <laughs> what is this? So he said, well, I was a personal friend of Tom's. I grew up with him and I visited him at the end. And he goes, I was in the hospital with him, and the nurses wouldn't let him have the cider because they said it'll spike your blood sugar. And his friend was saying, well, that's ridiculous. That's like not giving a dying man a cigarette, you know. Just let him have it. What is this really going to do, you know? Of everything here, the cider is not going to be the reason. So as soon as the nurses left, Tom told him, get me that cherry cider. And he drank the whole thing. <laughs> cup and he got in trouble from the nurses and this man is telling me this story and I am simultaneously laughing with tears just pouring down my face I can't believe uh, my brother and I felt so good that we were able to bring him that bit of joy right there at the end so yeah I'm gonna remember that give let people have things come on <laughs> all right we're going to listen to a little bit of what Tom sounds like now. Come on, Tommy. Guitar players are a breed of their own. When somebody is good, I mean, they get the shakes when they watch another good steel guitar player that break out in a cold sweat. And when we're big balls in Cowtown, guys come in and they just stand around with their mouths open and sweat just pouring off of them. Ladies and gentlemen, Tommy Morrell and the Time Warp Top Hands. <laughs>
Lindsay kind of had a pretty much a really jazzy flair with his band. Um, one of the things I loved about Tom was his ability to break down the changes of a song. He liked a lot of big band and jazz, and he would reharmonize and break them down to make them simpler, and yet they were more sophisticated. It was the simplicity is what made it so amazing, um, and the chord choices to kind of blend with the Western swing between the two worlds. He could really bring it together. Anyhow, um, one time we were on a recording session together and he had this huge binder, like huge three ring binder that he carried around of all of his personal handwritten arrangements. So chord arrangements, chord charts, violin parts written out, the whole nine yards and it was this thick. And we're sitting there at the session, and I'm just flipping through it, flipping through it, flipping through it. Every page, it's just magical, right? And he kind of could probably see this hungry kid look, you know, it's like, oh my God. And he goes, hey, are we on a gig next week together? And I said, yes. And he goes, well, hey, you know what? He goes, why don't you just take that chart book and bring it back to me next week? And I kind of read between the lines, and I took it home, and I photocopied every darn thing out of it. So I've got his chart book, basically. <laughs> Photocopies, anyway, but I've learned so much from it. All right. Miss you, Wolf. Okay, moving right along. This is a really special part of today for me. Um, I want to thank William Williams, first of all. Last week, I had a beautiful opportunity to meet and spend some time with Ms. Cleo Raymond. All right, so any photos here you see today are part of what uh, William has archived. She grew up in Dallas, was a graduate of Woodrow Wilson High in 1940. So all of her early training was in classical piano. And she talked about, my gosh, she goes, I just didn't like, I didn't like all the hours of practicing. She goes, I, I just, I didn't want to put that many hours of my life into something. And she discovered country and Western music, and she said, well, I liked it. It had just three chords. <laughs> and she started playing accordion. So uh, just as a little side note, too, she once warmed up for LBJ, our 36th president. So Cleo performed in the Philippine Islands, Japan, Korea, Guam, Hawaii, entertaining troops during the war, singing and yodeling and playing accordion. Bob Fo Hope referred to her saying, she's a real trooper, William Williams. All right, there's Cleo on KRLD. KRL She's a beautiful lady. Love that photo. Is this in Fairbanks? Yes. Patty Lou and the Texas Sweethearts. There she is in Fairbanks, Alaska. All right, I wanted to include this advert. You can see at the bottom, 12th Street and Jacksboro Highway. And you can see here, this was her maiden name, Cleo Lando. Yeah, so Cleo. Cleo Raymond, of course, is what she goes by now, but young Miss Cleo Lando. And again, here, Miss Cleo Lando and her accordion. You can see 2005 South Herve, just right over there in the Cedars in Dallas. Okay, the thing about this wonderful woman that I haven't told you, she's 99. So this is kind of my guest appearance for today. Um, she couldn't be here. But I loved how much detail she knew looking through these photos because we had this opportunity to sit down and look through them. And this one, she said, there I am standing in my parents' living room. That was my grand piano. Those boots were $5, the first pair I ever had. My mother made that skirt, that shirt was from the department store, and that hat was $1.99. <laughs> she knew everything. All right. <laughs> Now, I would in no way, shape, or form compare myself as a queen like Miss Cleo Raymond is, but we had a great girl power moment being accordion players and gals. Okay, so this is from our lovely afternoon with Cleo. Let me pull this up, actually. <laughs>
<laughs> Yay. I just love her. All right. One more little clip that I'd love to play from the afternoon with Cleo. Okay, here we go. She played the banjo. She played the electric guitar. She's older, the banjo, but she played the electric guitar. She played fiddle. She played guitar and sang. And I was the accordionist. She was the bass. Oh, wow. Anchorage, I think it was. That is that Patty Lou? Yeah, yeah, that's Patty Lou and Jerry Lee, Jerry. All right. Thank you so much for coming. That was Ms. Cleo Raymond, and it was a joy to get to meet her and spend some time with her. And thank you all for being here and letting me share some stories about my friends. <laughs> and some history as well. Thank you. Any last minute questions? I know we're right at time, but. An encore? Oh, well, okay. I got a perfect song to play. All right. <laughs> In the spirit of music and goodbyes, some trails are happy ones and others are blue. You know it's the way you ride your trail that counts. Here's a happy one for you. Happy trails to you until we meet again. And happy trails to you. Oh, keep smiling on to bed. Oh, who cares about the clouds when we're together? How to sing a song and bring the sunny weather. Happy trails to you until we meet again. Thank you all so much.